It was hot for a brief moment in time, and uh, that's fun when that happens. It doesn't happen often for, for the kind of work I do usually. So my name is Graham Smetcher. This is uh, Minimax. I'll tell you about what that is in a sec. But uh, first, a little bit about me, because this is not what I normally do. My normal uh, hats are, one is a consultant. I've been a consultant for about 15 years on mostly astrophysics experiments. So I have a cosmology lab at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, that I do work for. Um, we've worked on um, the South Pole Telescope, so the top left. Um, we built the electronics uh, on the top right, which is also part of the CHIME uh, uh, experiment, which is in the, the sort of center right. And we're working also on uh, a JAXA, sort of Japanese Space Agency uh, satellite mission to do uh, cosmology. <clears throat> um, that's my consulting hat. Uh, and then on the bottom, I've also been working part of a startup called T-Zero Technology, which is building uh, the same similar kinds of readout electronics. But we're aiming now instead of at uh, sort of megahertz to um, 10 megahertz SDR at uh, proper microwave, so gigahertz SDR. Um, we do a lot of open source. I mean, I use a lot of open source software. I don't do a lot of open source hardware. And the tooling I use for EDA is mostly vendor tools. And so this is like the first chance I get to, 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 to knit those two worlds together, which is fantastic. And this is a great venue for it. I've, I've, I've been looking for an excuse to come here for a while. Um, COVID made it hard, and then uh, this is the first chance I've had. Yeah, so that is to say, um, I don't, I'm in the unenviable position of presenting a Risk v CPU here to the people who invented the darn thing. It's, it's <laughs> seems like a bad idea, right? I, I, in my opinion, the, the space is really well populated already. There's excellent, excellent cores out there already. You had some permissibly licensed cores, and uh, the bar is pretty high to build another one. In addition, I, I fought building this for a long, long time. I didn't feel like I had the, the mandate for professional work to build something like this. And I didn't feel like I had the time as a hobbyist to build something like this. It's kind of in an awkward middle ground between professional work and hobbyist work. And I just wasn't sure where I sat. So I, I tried for a long time not to build this. And at some point, it became clear that I was wasting too much time, more time not building it than I would have building it in the first place. So the key here is differentiation. Right? It's really important that. If, if I'm going to build something like this, it has to be different from the ones that are already out there. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, it's a hobbyist project, which is fine, but it's not, like, it's not justifiable for me. The, the point here is that in the few places where a really small risk v core is actually useful, um, it's the whole system size that matters. And so you have to start thinking about the RAM. And so this compressed extension, the RVC extension I'm going to talk about next, is it's, it's table stakes. You need it to get to, to fit in the places where this core is justified. And if the core is not justified because you don't need the space, why are you using a small core? Um, and so if the compressed instruction ex extension is an essential extension, it's a bit of a contradiction in terms. And so I thought I would take, uh, take a look at the, the egg that is the compressed extension first rather than the chicken, which is the, the risk v core, and see where that led. Um, and what it does is it exposes some new design trades to the, um, to, to the user that are interesting and uh, useful. Um, it's an old idea, but it's a new, a new use of an old idea. All right, so what is the uh, compressed extension for the, <laughs> for the few people who, who, who aren't more conversant in this than I am? Um, the idea is that uh, the RISC-V instruction encoding is this nice regular encoding I've shown in the table on the left. Uh, there's only about four different vari varieties of the instruction encoding. Um, they're all highly regular. Uh, all the fields show up in the same space, and there's lots of, lots of space to express all the stuff you want to express. Um, that doesn't recognize the fact that the instructions you're using most often um, really is a huge, a, a tiny subset of the instructions you can express in this whole encoding. And so the, the, the RVC, the compressed extension, is an attempt to write in a smaller footprint the subset of instructions that you use more frequently, and the goal is to save uh, memory, save ROM and RAM in order to do so. Um, in exchange for that, you give up a lot, right? You're giving up um, uh, a lot of the instructions that you normally can express if in, in a 32-bit in a instruction set in a 16-bit space. And you're making the encoding a lot worse, right? You're, you're going from these four encodings on the left-hand side here to the, what, seven or eight encodings on the right-hand side. Um, so you end up with um, more decoding complexity. Um, these are quotes I pulled from the RISC-V inst uh, instruction set guide, <laughs> who the authors were sitting here yesterday. I'm not sure if they're here today. Um, but the, the clear goal is that uh, the compressed extensions are, it's a pre-decoder stage, right? You read this 16-bit instruction, you expand it combinatorially out to a 32-bit instruction that you would have otherwise expressed as a 32-bit RISC-V instruction, and you execute that. So it's, it's you know, chicken and egg, clearly the chicken comes first. Um, this is the quote I like the best because we're going to do the opposite thing. It's the C extension is not designed to be a standalone ISA. 
let's do the opposite and see where that takes us. <clears throat> um, if we can do that, what we're exchanging is we're going from a, a, a regular simple decoder um, we're, to a much worse encoding, a much worse in terms of like logic usage and irregularity. Um, what do we gain back? We gain back, so we, we're going from a 32-bit wide instruction pipeline to a 16-bit wide instruction pipeline. Smaller, maybe it's deeper, but it's at least narrower or less wide. Um, there's also this weird thing where the, the, the performance trade-off in the RVC instruction set, they decided that the um, that forcing all 32-bit instructions to be 32-bit aligned uh, ate up too much of, the, of the, the performance advantage of having a 16-bit instruction set, right? So rather than inserting a dummy instruction to align all 32-bit instructions to a 32-bit uh, address in memory, um, you would just accept that you had some 32-bit instructions that were split across adjacent places in memory, and then you have to realign things on the fly. Um, if you only have a 16-bit instruction pipeline, you don't need to do that, right? So there's extra flip-flops, extra little bits of muxing to get that to work that doesn't exist. Um, and finally, the, the, one of the ideas is that you can go from a, a true three-port register file. So if you look at the left-hand side, um, imagine an adder, right? I take register one, uh, register two, add them and store the result in register three. There's actually three ports on that register file. If, um, if you look at the right-hand side here with the RISC-V compressed instructions, that's not the case. You take uh, register one, uh, add it to register two, and store the results always back in register one again, right? So if I have a register file that has two ports, one of which is read-write, the other one is read-only, um, I can build the thing on the right, but I can't build the thing on the left. So those are what might be gained. What do you lose? You lose a lot of expressibility. Um, you've lost a bunch of instructions right out of the gates, just things you just can't say with a single instruction anymore. You've also leaked the ABI, uh, so the, the application binary interface, the, 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 um, the function call semantics of, so let's, say, let, let's say, the C language. Um, uh, use some registers preferentially over other registers. And that starts to leak into the microarchitecture here because some of these fields for the 16-bit encodings are narrower than the full 32-bit um, register file. You can only say um, address registers 8 through 15 for some of these instructions, right? So you're, you're, you're making preferential, you're starting to treat registers in the register file preferentially as a reflection of deci decisions made in the ABI, which is not wrong, it's just different. This is our Sixth, good, bad, and ugly. I feel like every talk so far has, that if the next one doesn't, I'm gonna assume that they used to have one and took it out because it was embarrassing. <laughs> um, so that's what's weird. What's bad is that some instructions are, uh, if you rewrite them in RVC only, they get slow. Um, some of them it's because of things you can't say, like I can't take, I can't express in RVC, uh, take register one and shift it right by register two. I can't do that. So instead, I have to have a loop where I unroll all of those shifts into a shift one, shift one, shift one, shift one, and I jump into it somewhere in the middle, right? So I'm converting uh, what is a, a shift by register contents to a jump into a table full of single, uh, single shifts. A little weird, you can do it, it's slow. Multiplications, you can't express that in RVC only, just can't. And uh, branches become much less expressive. So you go from being able to say branch if less than or equal to, to you have to do a subtraction explicitly, and then a comparison of branch if equal to zero or not equal to zero. And then there's the ugly ones you just can't even write down at all, right? Like if, if I want to say store byte or store half word, that's a perfectly reasonable RISC-32 instruction, but it doesn't exist in, in RVC. Um, I can only do words with 32-bit reads and writes. And if you imagine there's a 32-bit address and data, uh, data bus uh, hanging off the side of the RTL, um, I, I can add these four wires that are like byte write enables, but I've got no way in the ISA to actually tell you what to do with them, right? So there's no way to express that either. Uh, CSR is another good example, right? There's just no space in the instruction encoding to do CSR stuff. So the, the <clears throat> before we solve that problem, let's talk a bit about what we would actually gain. Like, what's the point here? These are the primitives for a Xilinx Ultrascale FPGA. They look a lot like the 7 Series. Xilinx stuff mostly looks like this. Um, on the left-hand side, so in the center there, I've shown the block RAM, and there's there's actually a dye microphotograph. This is an infrared uh, picture of uh, Kintex Ultrascale 40, just to show the relative size of these things. So you can't see the relative size of things because everything's small. Um, but the, uh, the the block RAMs look like little squares in this photograph, and the distributed memories are just stripes across the columns across the device. Um, the goal here is to see if we can impedance match, basically make a good impedance match between the architecture we're designing uh, and the primitives that, that use them. And this isn't strictly a Xilinx thing because Xilinx has all the same constraints as, as anyone making silicon, right? So memories tend to be 
uh, easy to build in certain geometries. There's certain things like dual port that you, they're, they're kind of table stakes to have a, a, an architecture that works for this kind of thing. And so you expect the primitives on Intel or uh, in Sky130 or whatever to be kind of like these primitives anyways. So it's, yeah, I feel like this generalizes pretty well. Um, the ROMs in Xilinx land anyways come in these four, uh, 36 kilobit, so four kilobyte-ish um, uh, primitives. And they have native dual ports. So um, moreover, the point here is that the dual ports, I can give port A and port B different geometries. I can say one of them is 16 bits wide, one of them is 32 bits wide. Um, and they still address the same memory just the way I want if I'm going to have a 32-bit data path and a 16-bit instruction path. So what I, what I can do is build a, a Harvard core where my instruction and data paths are separate. And I can, uh, without penalty, reunite them at the block RAM for instruction, for instruction reading. So it costs very little to have this uh, sort of a two-port um, instruction data path where they have different geometries. Um, that also unlocks, um, I, can, I can run this core now, assuming I have my separate uh, instruction and data uh, access paths to the block memory uh, at one clock per instruction, which is, sounds great. We'll see later on that uh, not everything is fast here. So uh, building an architecture that runs slowly, even at one CPI, isn't like, you know, party. Um, so the register file as well, um, the point here is that the, we can build these register files that have two ports where one of them is read-write, one of them is read-only perfectly out of the, uh, the architecture that Silicon gives us here. In fact, we have a 32-bit, uh, sorry, 32-deep register file ISA, and the primitives here give us 64 registers for free, and so we'll see how to spend them in just a little bit. Um, but in both cases, for block memory and for distributed memory, we have a good impedance match between the thing that we're hypothesizing and the, the primitives that the Silicon gives us, and it generalizes well from Xilinx. Yeah, and so it's jumping to the punchline here, we're going to keep the RISC-V, the 32-bit instruction set architecture. We're just going to emulate it. So every time the, the, uh, the microcode here runs into a 32-bit instruction, we're going to fault. We're going to jump to the higher 32 uh, of the 64-entry register file, and we're going to run out of those registers to emulate the 32-bit instruction we couldn't execute directly. When we're finished, we write back the state to the lower 32-bit registers, and we jump back into the code that faulted, and then keep going from there. Um, in order to write all those instructions, it takes a whole bunch of instruction decoding. It's all written in RVC, so we're writing 16-bit instructions to emulate 32-bit instructions. Um, it takes about a kilobyte of ROM, um, so it costs some, but it's, it's uh, depending on, on, on how strapped for ROM you are. Have you spent your savings? Maybe. It depends on the application. Um, it requires very, very little RTL support, right? We need to do only four things here. One, we need to trap. Um, out of user code when we, when we want to fault. We need to read user state into um, uh, uh, microcode state. So we just need to sort of overload a move so that we can address all 64 registers. We need to write back, which is the same operation in reverse. And we need to thunk from, from microcode once we're finished back into user code and clear the, um, the bit that says we're running out of the top 32 registers. Um, these extensions, so we have four of these sort of custom uh, instructions and a trap. They all uh, tuck nicely into uh, space in the RVC instruction set that's reserved for custom instructions. And so we're not going off script too far here. We're not breaking compatibility with the, with the ISA. And it only ever actually lives in microcode. So the regular code, everything else needs a regular compiler and no extensions, no, nothing special. Um, bonus is you can think of this as like a really crappy way of, of, of jumping from uh, a 32-bit instruction to a 16-bit emulation that runs the instruction, where you have all this extra overhead. Rather than just jumping, you're, you're forcing a trap and then a decoding and all this sort of manual stuff that has to happen in microcode just to get to the bit of code you wish you'd run in the first place. You can call that directly if you want to. There's no need for you to jump uh, through these hoops to go through emulation if you want to uh, just call. So I guess you can do that. And, and extra risk of extension, since you paid for all this um, instruction decoding, table jumps, all that sort of stuff to, to demultiplex these traps into the code you actually wish you'd run. It's very cost-free to build more support for RISC-V extensions as long as you don't mind that they're running in emulation. Yeah, and here's what it looks like in a, you know, we're not going to read this thing, but the point here is that uh, there's two implementations here, right? The one on the bottom is uh, is the smaller of the two, it's the slower of the two, and so the, the clock cycles here are roughly equivalent. I've scaled them to match-ish. Um, and you'll see that the one on the bottom is about twice as long, and it's a, it's a little smaller if we look at, we'll look at uh, implementation cost in a sec. The one on the top is faster uh, by more than a factor of two. Um, and the two of them, so the one on the top takes about 70 clocks-ish per emulated instruction. It depends on the instruction. The one on the bottom takes 170 clocks, so it's more than a factor of two slower. 
Uh, and what we're actually executing here is the, it's like a preamble. It's the very first thing you'd expect to happen in a, a piece of setup code. We're actually loading an immediate. The thing about RISC, the RVC is that it's really, really bad at loading 32-bit immediates. It's very expensive and slow. So this could have been maybe f uh, 10 RVC instructions. We wrote it down as two 32-bit uh, instructions, and we paid this gigantic performance cost for the, for the privilege. But if it's a piece of setup code, you know, maybe it's part of like, you know, we're setting up the stack or we're just doing some piece of, we don't care if it's slow. It's only going to happen once. So maybe we just write it that way and we don't care that much. All right, um, this is a look at, from an Artix, uh, this is like the RDA35 board, it has one of these A35Ts in it, and it's kind of hidden in, you know, this is like a, a mid-range FPGA from a number of years ago. It's not the smallest FPGA, and so I'm kind of overstating it, but I'm also not running this on like a ultra scale plus gigantic thing and showing you how small the dot is. It's reasonable to say that this is small in a smallish FPGA. Um, it costs, I'm pretty sure we're going to go with the shifter uh, as, as like the main branch of the code. I just don't, you know, it's new enough that I haven't folded it in yet because 481 LUT 6 is, is still really small. The register count is also, it's kind of shockingly small. It's, we're going to see, you know, the Fmax is going to suffer as a result, but the amount of state we're carrying around in this design is, is just about zero. It's like program counter and not much else, right? It's, it really is not, there's not a lot of flip-flops here. I would argue that's probably a bad thing because that's why Fmax sucks. Um, and we implement, so RV32IC, so we have the 32-bit base ISA plus the compressed ISA. There's a couple of extras. I've added uh, ZCB, uh, some elements of the code size reduction stuff, because I needed something to express this half word and byte right. Um, otherwise, there's no way to write it down and no way to get it done. So I needed to steal some exceptions from other extensions in the ISA to make that happen. Um, and I've also implemented something from ZBKB, which is like the, it's cryptography, I think. It's um, uh, a zip and unzip. So we're taking, and it's um, useful for like parity calculations. Just for funsies, because it was only about six instructions or 10 instructions long. It's quite small. There's no interrupts and extensions. And so this is still like, you know, not a core you should pick up and use in, in lieu of other cores, because it's like, it's only good at running straight line code and deeply, deeply embedded stuff where you know you can give up all of this other stuff that is normal. But, and, you know, implementing exceptions and interrupts is probably also something that fits really well with a micro-coded thing, as long as, again, you can eat the, the, the overhead of emulation. Um, here's a top level that does a blinky thing. Um, the ROM is the big thing, the core is the small thing, and then the um, comparators for address and data checks to address the LED is the stuff on the right here. Nothing exciting here. Um, again, this points out that it's a Harvard, so we have this, or modified Harvard, so we have a, a separate instruction in data buses, and they meet at the block RAM. Um, if you were putting other stuff in here, if you had like an Axie uh, interface that you were talking to, it would show up here as well. Um, there'd be some question about like how to, how to tuck that in without bumping into multiplexing or, or like, you know, read back, getting your data back out of the, out of the bus stuff, but it wouldn't make this a whole lot bigger. Um, in terms of the microarchitecture, so we talked about um, memories, like the um, uh, uh, ROMs and RAMs, and distributed memory being something that we care about a good impedance match for. If they were like a tiny little block in the corner, um, we cared about the wrong thing, right? We optimized for the wrong thing. The point here is that uh, a doubling the size of the register file, which we would have to do if we added more ports, um, would be conspicuous here. And the RAM, this is not to scale, right? Those RAMs that on the actual die microphotograph I showed you, you can point to a RAM and it doesn't look like this and it probably doesn't really scale with the, you know, the, the horizontal dimension for sure. So this is not like, this isn't a representative map of what the, what the core sizes and the relative sizes look like. But the RAM is, even here, uh, it's, you know, this is the smallest RAM we can get. There's only one of it. In a, in a real application, we might need several of these, and they do start to look conspicuous in terms of the overall floor plan. The microarchitecture is, uh, this is like a cartoon sketch of what it looks like. Um, the main point here is that it's, it's, it's pretty minimalistic. There's not that much here, and there's not, you know, all of it is, is, is essential. Um, now, the, the, the thing that sucks the most is the, the Fmax. It's only about 60 megahertz on an Arctic 7, which is pretty bad. Um, around about 100 megahertz, I think a lot of having to care about Fmax goes away in the kinds of applications that you care about for this sort of thing. And then, I don't know, there's some ceiling that, that a clever person with lots of time could get to. Um, it's mostly fan out and routing, <clears throat> which uh, is a result of having all of this combinatorial. Actually, it's surprisingly low on, on, on actual data path, but it's mostly LUTs and routing. Um, I had a look on the airplane here for the best way to fix this. Um, and it's actually pretty straightforward, right? The, the, the instruction memory currently has a two cycle latency on the instruction port. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, that's best practices for the instruction memory because it, um, 
It lets us reach fmax with the block RAM. We don't care about that fmax because it's much, much, much higher than this fmax. And so it's reasonable to steal one of the register stages in, from inside the block RAM, turn it into a single uh, cycle of latency, and then diffuse that extra cycle across the decode path on the left. If we were to make this into a conventional sort of uh, fetch decode execute type um, uh, core, you'd want to register the, maybe the outputs of the register file. Um, that doesn't work here because suddenly we're writing back to a different register file address than we were reading from because it's a different clock cycle. Right? It's a clock cycle later. And so we can push the, the, the register up to but not past or into the register file, which is about halfway past the critical path, which I've shown here. So um, the hardest part about this is figuring out what to name everything when I change the, the, the pipelining and, and understanding the new consistency for, for how things ought to be. Um, and that's it. I mean, loose ends, next steps. I'm excited about um, getting them multiplied. There's a, so Z, ZCB, the new code size reduction uh, extension, includes a, a 32 by 32 low half multiply. So there's c.mul. There's no c.mul hu or the upper half doesn't exist. But that would make it fit really well for things like DSP, for sort of low 16-bit DSP I can start to express in pure 16-bit instructions. I get to keep that one clock per instruction thing. And, and that kind of unlocks stuff that I'm interested in. Like my day job does a lot of DSP. And so naturally, that's, that's something that, that excuses me writing this core in my spare time a little more. Um, uh, that's really it. And exceptions and interrupts feels like a homework assignment that I have to finish, but uh, that'll happen as well. Um, this is the first project. I'm going to show this slide here. I didn't even write the Verilog that's in this core right now. Somebody else did, Sean. Thank you. Um, I wrote a VHDL version of this, and then in an attempt to get it running on the open road, um, you know, we were nudged very hard to, to try to do this. Um, suddenly, this sort of this open source promise of like other people getting into your code and doing stuff with it started to actually happen. Um, and so this is a view of it's an 8051 versus Minimax. Uh, both on GF180 MCUC. The one on the left, it doesn't have register files, and so we're cheating here. Um, I don't know what the register file situation is with the 8051. I guess there just isn't one. Um, but it's, it's very, very small, uh, which is cool. It's also very, very slow. And so are we, you know, are we being fair here? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's been fun. Yeah, and like, I didn't, I didn't do this. It's awesome, uh, but uh, I can't take credit for it. So thanks very much. Uh, any questions? Great talk. I, I saw this on GitHub a long time ago. I've been curious. Um, have you considered doing the RV32EC, um, which would give you the reduced register set? I, it would give you better compression, probably. Yeah, EC is that's when you go to sixteen entry register files, right? Mm -hmm. So if we jump back to the this slide here, this thing gives us in these DP RAM sixty fours on the right hand side, this is a, a sixty four deep one bit memory. This is kind of the currency that you want to build the register files in, at least for Xilinx, right? And so I, I get them. I can't, you know, I don't save anything by going to a sixteen wide register file. Right, but you might get a better compression ratio because the sixteen registers oh. would fall into the C extension more often. I think always, actually, but more often, at least. Yeah, I haven't thought about how that works. I think it's always the same way. Like, in the EC, everything is in the compressed form. I think so, yeah. It's like A2 kind of form. Yeah, OK. Could be. I should look. If you care about performance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I was going to say, also, the, the, um, the other thing that's really exciting is the, the, the improvements in LLVM, like every generation, the, the compilation target is better and better at hitting the compressed ex instructions at, than before. And so the la you know, every time I get a new LLVM release, the first thing I jump for is the, is the release notes and go looking for ways that, that this sucks less. <laughs> I guess this sucks less. Um, this does less emulation when it could be doing direct execution. Is there any, uh, that was a question I had, anything in the 32-bit instructions that you see that couldn't be expressed in a 16-bit compressed instructions? Yeah, I mean, besides the CSRs and the um, uh, shifts, and like you can jump through numbers of hoops to get it all working. I had to jump through them for the shifts, for the uh, byte and, and half word writes. Mm -hmm. um, I can't do a, a, a high multiplication, even with the uh, ZCB mull, mm -hmm. um, which would be fantastic for, you know, if, I, if I'm going to do DSP with a, 
with, with a, uh, a low half multiplier. I kind of top out at doing 16-bit by 16-bit DSP. If I want to do 32-bit DSP, I need that mal high, um, and I have to emulate it very, very slowly. So that's, that's a shame. That's a shame. Okay, yeah. But who cares? No, maybe nobody but me. <laughs> So I, I was wondering about with the ZCB, I know there's a bunch of other instructions in there, um, and part of the purpose was to, to bring down code size. Uh, you know, some people were very meticulous about that. I'm wondering, um, like, do you think that adopting that would actually help you bring more instructions, more of it would bring more instructions out of uh, 32i and into 32c as a result? Yeah, uh, more of uh, ZCB? Yeah. Um, let me just jump towards this one here. So one of the differences between these two implementations is that the one on the bottom is actually doing emulation for 16-bit instructions as well, right? We're emulating, so only shifts with a shift amount is not one um, are treated this way, but we jump into the same emulation loop and then decode 16-bit instructions that we don't implement directly and then emulate those two. I could imagine doing the same thing if I wanted those ZCB instructions at no implementation cost, just ROM cost, if the, if the speed is not a problem. Um, or like adding extra, these are all relatively simple instructions, right? Adding them to the, to the direct execution is going to cost a couple of lots. It's not going to cost that much. Um, either way, it's fine, yeah. Well, what about the other ZC extensions? This, if you want. Yeah, um, I have I, I'm, I have the, the thing handy here, but I'm not going to open it up here. I, I actually don't know it well enough to... Uh, okay. ooh, here we go. Lost it. Um, I don't know well enough to say for sure. Okay. Um, there's, there's lots of stuff in there that it seems to be, like you start branching into purpose specific, specific instructions, cryptography or, or whatever, and, or vector. Um, for my use case, I guess I don't care that much. Okay. I have another question. Very quick one. Uh, it has two parts. One is, um, why don't you use Skywater 130 when it's open source, and why don't you choose the GF180? And second is uh, the, the use of open road. Do you use that for the entire um, physical process or just only part of it? Yeah, let me, let me make first make sure that me is defined properly. Me is not me. Me is, is actually Sean sitting in the back over there. Um, that, so we, we, were, um, we were pushed to use GF180 because I think they're, you know, these, these need to justify themselves. Um, if there's no users, there's no, it doesn't happen, it stops happening, it's kind of use it or lose it. And so I think I was nudged into using GF180 because, because the use it or lose it was, was important, right? The, the reason, I would have picked GF130 for sure because there are already good RAM primitives for GF, GF130. There aren't for GF180, right? So, so we're, we're early adopters and it, it became quite a problem to synthesize register files and memories that were viable at all, especially dual port, yeah. So I, I might have missed this during your presentation, but do you have an idea of how the uh, ROM size compares to the um, uh, to the core itself? In in GF one eighty. Yeah. Um, Sean sent me an image from a little while ago. I don't have it up here because I think uh, things evolve slightly over the time. But you get these giant blocks of register file and, and, and ROM, um, and you get this little tiny core tucked between them. It really fits in the elbows. The, the problem is, though, that the, um, uh, because the, one of the focuses for the, for, the, for the ROMs and RAMs is to shrink them, and, like make a better tailor to the, to the, to the, to the silicon. Um, and so it's kind of unfair to show something that's been hyper-optimized compared against something that is deliberately not hyper-optimized because it's just not mature yet. So I didn't show that, but yes, we do. I also like your Google searches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, hmm, I should have put that in there deliberately, but it's an accident. <laughs> Can I ask a last question about sure. the, um, the startup sequence that you showed, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, there's this concept of, uh, of fusion, so you could see like this, those two are actually the sequence of 10 RVC instructions because you know it's loading a 32-bit immediately to look into that. Yeah, um, so y you're imagining that microcode could assume that probably there's some high likelihood that an LUI is followed by an add I mm -hmm. and then emulate those things together rather than like going through the whole process twice. Yeah. Um, everything that goes into the critical path in the beginning of the microcode emulation uh, penalizes every single emulation, right? So there's some very quick, like there has to be a huge payoff for any of this kind of work in microcode because it hurts everywhere and it pays off, you know, some of the time but not that often. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a bunch of microcode 
optimization that could happen that would pay off and maybe get us down to like 60 or 50 instructions. But anything that blows that number back up is really painful. That's interesting. Thank you. Oh, that's a question about 10. Sorry. So I think your second slide, you pointed out, um, you know, uh, Minimax is supposed to fit in somewhere that didn't previously exist. Um, do you have any comparison between like the resource usage for Serve and Femto and Pico RV32 to the Minimax yeah, on I, the ultra scale? I do. Um, I don't like, I didn't, I decided not to show that deliberately because um, because we're not we're not we're not at war with each other, right? Like every one of these cores, especially the ones that have a, a track record traction maturity, um, are are fantastic, and I have no intention of com even pretending to compete with them. Um, th so, just speaking in terms of like, let me draw the napkin sketch here. Um, the the Xilinx's Pico Blaze sits at the very very left edge of this performance, like this um, resource usage versus um, architecture line. That starts at the origin, and it's 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 kind of a demented architecture. It's eight bits. It has this weird eighteen bit uh, instruction space. It's very tiny. It's too tiny. They've thrown out too many things to to sort of code golf this core down to the point where it's uh, where it's the smallest. Um, that's an over like that's too far. It, uh, we start getting real cores at like the the serve. The serve is the, is the smallest on the on the chart. Um, serve with uh, with compressed is a little bigger. Uh, we're about the same size as that, um, and I think within the noise, like which one is smaller, is like up to the what else you have hooked up to it, and which day you run the tools on, and whose tools they are. Um, and then uh, Femto RV32 is next. Um, there's this gap where you get to like the Pico RV32s, and then things sort of run up from the 700 lots uh, and up from there. So there is kind of a sparse space at the bottom, and I think there should be a sparse space at the bottom because the actual applications where you care about every single LUT are smaller than the number of people writing these tiny cores. <laughs> awesome. Then let's take the speaker again.